works. All right. When I was in third grade, I was suspended for accidentally making a YouTube video go viral about why students shouldn't be attending my school. <laughs> to this day, my dad will begrudgingly tell you he spent more time taking trips to the principal's office for me than all of my siblings combined. Needless to say, I probably should have anticipated a career in social media was in my future. Hi, I'm Zaria, otherwise known as Duo the Owl on TikTok. Perhaps you've posted a TikTok and all of a sudden a big green owl is bombarding your comments. That was probably me. Or maybe you've seen a video of an owl twerking on a conference room table and giving birth to sponges. Of course, not at the same time. That would be ridiculous. Well, that was my chaotic brain. Now, we've seen the numbers in the headlines. Over 6 million followers with over 650 million views, all with a $0 budget, a crusty owl suit, and an iPhone. Now, that's cool and all, but I've never been into numbers anyway. I don't think they tell the real story. And the story I'm about to tell you today is a story of how Duolingo became an internet sensation. Now, when it comes to my job in social media, I could talk to you about a lot of different things. I could talk to you about navigating legal complexities, or maybe how to go viral, or maybe even what to do when you've been canceled. Or I could spend the next 10 minutes absolutely bullshitting each and every single one of you. And I'd anticipate maybe only 1% of you would actually catch on. Because the reality is very few people actually know what a social media manager does, including those in marketing. And the impact my role can have on a business that's small and on culture at large. And spoiler alert, no, it's not just posting cute Instagram photos. Now, when we talk about disruption in marketing, it's usually accompanied by a large definition that doesn't really make sense in some big sans serif text. Now, I don't think disruption has to be revolutionary. In fact, quite the opposite. It's advocating for innate human truths that we all know and feel in our gut, yet we still end up denying. For example, we all hate ads, including marketers, yet we spend $460 billion a year as an industry to create flashy 30-second spots. Why? I hate them, you hate them, we all hate them, yet we keep creating them. See, when it comes to disruption, you often have to acknowledge human truths. And that can tend to create a gap between the reality we're in and what we know we have to change. Acknowledgement of human truths often means we have to go back to step one, reevaluate everything we've been doing, and start questioning ourselves. Acknowledgement usually means investment and in particular, investment of time and critical thinking, two growingly scarce resources in our ever-changing world. Now, when I was growing up, I was pegged as a troublemaker. I often said or did the wrong thing or crossed the line one too many times, and honestly, I still face that in my career today. But the thing is, I also didn't mind spending the time to prove someone wrong or prove something wrong. In fact, that's probably why I got suspended. The thing is, I actually don't value my time at all. If somebody said, I'm going to prove an argument in two hours, I'll spend six hours trying to prove them wrong. While growing up, I was convinced that I was broken, that something in me just wasn't right. For some reason, I didn't have that stop in my head that told me, don't do it, don't push the red button, just go with the flow. Something was wrong with me. But it wasn't until I was much older that I realized the biggest secret adults were hiding from us is that troublemakers are actually the ones that cause seismic cultural shifts. They're the ones that do the things that most of us are too scared to do ourselves, even if we know they'll make an impact. Troublemakers take the time to cause trouble. And they don't mind being wrong in addressing the wrong. In fact, troublemakers are our world's disruptors. They're the ones we should be adding to our team to our social circles, and to our lives. Now, the funny thing about human nature is that we truly fear change, yet it's what we yearn for most. We never want to be the ones to press the red button, even though we always want something new and fresh and never been done before. So that begs the question, how do we find the ones that will press the red button? Being a disruptor really comes down to two things. Number one, understanding calculated risks. And number two, my personal favorite, pissing someone off. Now, at Duolingo, we've defined calculated risk as a consciously bold decision that marries intention with impact. 
Essentially, a risk is worth the trouble if we can prove a true positive impact. This could be brand awareness, gaining new users, showing social responsibility, just being part of culture, the list goes on. But what do I mean by worth the trouble? Well, I love point two, pissing someone off. There's usually two groups of people you can piss off in social media. There's the external group and the internal group. Externally, a lot of social media managers and other marketing teams actually hate us. They don't think the strategy we're doing is impactful and they don't see it as long lasting. We'll jump into that a little bit later. And number two, your internal group. Just because you create something that people love externally doesn't necessarily mean everyone on the inside is okay with it. And at that point, we tend to ask for forgiveness instead of forgive, for ask for forgiveness instead of permission. The cost of disruption is risk. And the issue with risk is that you're probably gonna piss someone off, but you have to make sure it's not the wrong person. Let me give you an example. So, as I said earlier, a common misconception about Duolingo is that we have no social strategy and we've illegitimized real social media work. Where I think real social media work tends to be defined by a ton of slides and ideas that exist there that don't really see the light of day, but I digress. Disclaimer, I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way, of course, within the bounds of what's morally correct and incorrect of creating content. It's purely subjective. Honestly, I could be irrelevant in the next six months if TikTok gets banned. Things happen, times change, people change. However, just because you may think it's irrelevant or just because a marketing person may think it's irrelevant doesn't mean that our, our viewers think the same. Our strategy is really centered around two main insights. Number one, our brand insight. Language learning is hard, but Duolingo makes it fun. And our audience insight. Gen Z wants to be entertained, not sold to. The thing is, our viewers don't think in strategy. They want us to entertain them. So although it may look like we didn't put much effort into creating something, we might have just thrown spaghetti on the wall, the reality is, if our learners don't want something to look like an ad, it's not going to look like an ad. Now, to some of you, this may seem super intuitive. That obviously makes sense. Why would you do anything different? But within marketing, we're really shifting the way content is made, consumed, and amplified. I promise this is a very big deal. Now, if you don't believe me yet, let's talk in a language we can all speak, money. On average, every 1,000 views on TikTok costs marketers $9.50. So that could be through paid advertising, so those are ads you see on your feed, production cost of actually creating the content, and maybe even influencer marketing. So if you take that $9.50 per 1,000 views, and you multiply it by our total organic views, which means views for free, that's 650 million views, which equals about $6.5 media value all for zero dollars. Or I guess you could say our production costs. So let's subtract about $10,000. That usually includes getting a spa day, whoever's actually in the suit, uh, moving the suit back and forth from the west coast to the east coast, and maybe the dinner I had on set. That's $6.5 million, all for free, because we listened to our audience and met them where they were at. And that's resulted into hundreds of thousands of new app downloads. Now, I don't want to make it seem like disruption was easy and it was an absolute walk in the park. Actually, when we first started our TikTok account, we were dealing with a really tough challenge. Language learning is not sexy. Quite honestly, education was kind of grouped in the so-called boring categories. You know, health, finance, law, shipping, you know the type. And if you actually look at our first content that we ever created, it was product driven, it was boring, and it was a little bit embarrassing, quite honestly. But since then, we've really grown to understand our audience and use those insights I just discussed before. Now, the funny thing is, when I talk to other people in these industries, the so-called boring category, they'll often say, well, like, we just can't be like you. Like, Duolingo's just so different. But remember what I mentioned earlier? Disruption usually takes critical thinking and time. A strategy is not going to just come to you. You have to work at it. You have to think about it. For us, ours was making Duo a creator himself. He was gonna feel and go through the same emotions as we would when we're on TikTok, and in a way be a form of internet satire, where we're making fun of these internet bubbles we're in, and it's kind of ridiculous that an owl can do the same trends we're doing. 
So while we were using the critical thought and kind of reevaluating and starting from scratch, we started to ask ourselves a lot of different questions. Number one, why did we decide that these categories couldn't be social first? Why was education deemed to be boring? Why couldn't we be entertaining too? Why did we leave it only to the McDonald's of the Wen and the Wendy's of the world to be at the speed of culture? Now here's the thing. Language learning is not at the center of all your thoughts, and that's okay. To be honest, when you look up what people think and use social for language learning, it usually centers around a middle schooler complaining about getting a C minus and hating his foreign language teacher. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll screenshot a lesson and tell us why we're wrong. And most of the time when people talk about Duolingo, they actually meant to tag Dua Lipa. <laughs> language learning, it's just not at the center of our thoughts and that's not what we're gonna use social for. And that's okay, we'll meet you exactly where you're at. And that's exactly what we did with Duo. Now, I don't think any of this is revolutionary. In fact, I hope this is pretty intuitive to all of you. What I do think is revolutionary is that we allowed ourselves to break through the idea of what we can or can't be. We didn't let ourselves be held back by being education app in Pittsburgh. We allowed ourselves to break through the boundaries. We allowed ourselves to speak human truths. And we allowed ourselves to let a Gen Z, fresh out of college, run our social media. Now, the funny thing about marketers is we tend to think very highly of ourselves, and sometimes myself included, thinking that we're always at the pulse of culture. We're always on top of all the trends. So if we are that, aren't we inherently disruptors? And the short answer is no. When it comes down to it, we have to work at it. You have to go step by step. You have to reevaluate. You have to put that investment of time and critical thinking in. And it's a little bit sad that when we talk about TikTok, we kind of exclude it only to Gen Z. But the reality is, learning and mastering trends in TikTok is actually pretty similar to learning a language. See, at Duolingo, we love our legal counsel. We call him Legal Steve. Um, very few social media managers probably say that. Great guy. He's in his upper 40s, and he's actually been on TikTok longer than we have. He has over 15,000 followers, and he will come often running to me with trends and ideas he wants to be a part of. That kind of breaks this whole notion of only Gen Z can be on TikTok. In fact, there's nursing home residents, there's nuns, there's even pets that have bigger accounts and presences than we do. It's all about using that critical thinking and that time to recreate and reevaluate what you're doing wrong. Now, a little over a year ago, I was standing on a stage accepting an award as the youngest person in the room for Social Marketer of the Year, all for using a zero-dollar budget, an iPhone, and a crusty owl suit to make Duolingo viral. Now, I don't think disruption is revolutionary. In fact, I had a lot of things working against me. At one point, I was even told that TikTok just wasn't a company priority. But I also had a lot of things working for me. I was put in a place of privilege where I was empowered to run with my ideas. If I wanted to waste the time on it, go for it. And that's exactly what I did. Again, disruption does not have to be revolutionary. It doesn't have to mean that you're starting a new trend or you're constantly on top of everything. Most of the time, it just means building resilience or learning from your mistakes or using critical thinking and time. And sometimes, disruption just means making an owl twerk on a conference room table. Thank you.